I'm Gwendolyn Osborne. I'm thrilled to have you with us today as we visit the lovely country of Australia. We will be speaking with and tasting with three incredibly talented and iconic families or uh, winemakers um, as we taste through wines from um, three iconic wineries. Um, if you have the wines already, wonderful. Please go ahead and get those into some glassware. Uh, we're tasting all three wines tonight. I encourage you to taste all three. They're all amazing and will certainly last a few days if you can't finish them all. That said, as always, this video will live on on the wine.com YouTube channel. The three wines that we are tasting in order are the Pusey Vale Riesling from Eden Valley. And then we'll move on to the Torbrek Cuvée Juvenile from Barossa Valley, and then the Derenberg Dead Arm Shiraz from McLaren Vale. So I'm really excited about these wines. Um, huge fan of Australian wines and uh, especially the people there and even these guests because I've had the privilege of actually meeting all of them, which is wonderful. Um, this map that you're looking at here shows where all of these uh, wines are coming from. So we're down in South Australia and um, all these regions are, are fairly close to the city of Adelaide here. So we're gonna be tasting wine from both Eden Valley and Barossa Valley. I'm gonna put a little mouse hovering around those if you can't see them very well, but these two are right next to each other and we're going to be having one from each and it'll be great to kind of see the stylistic difference. So obviously one's gonna be a Riesling and one is um, a Roman blend, but these two places really highlight the differences you can have in topography and elevation somewhere. So we're gonna learn all about that from our guests. Then the third one we're having is over in McLaren Vale, which is there by the coast. And this region just has its own very unique terroir and soil. So the wines that we're tasting also, um, these are coming from, like I said, one of the, um, some of the most iconic families and wineries. Um, these are, you know, these are the tried and true quality driven um, wineries that highlight the wines and the quality that is coming from Australia and has been produced for decades. This is just the kind of the quintessential true Australian wine that we're going to be showcasing. So really excited to taste all of these. All three of these are some favorites. They have been for some time and our guests are um, delightful, entertaining, and quite knowledgeable. And I will introduce them now. So representing Pusey Vale from Eden Valley, Miss Louisa Rose. Um, and then from Torbeck Winery and Barossa, Monsieur Ian Hongel. And then our McLaren Vale connection from um, Derenberg Winery, Chester Osborne. Welcome everyone. It's fantastic to have you here. Thank you so much for taking time to share your stories, your wines, your knowledge. We're excited to dive in. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so I, I wanna start with our white wine. We're just gonna dive into the tasting. Um, so um, we're gonna go into Pusey Vale, Eden Valley Riesling. And um, Louisa, first welcome. Thank you so Thank much you. Um, for being here. Gwendolyn, it's an absolute pleasure. Oh, good. Um, great to see you again. And so this is a project of the Hill Smith family, which is one of the oldest winemaking families in Australia. It could be the oldest, but it was one of the, one of the oldest. And um, this project, which uh, I love, was always about Riesling, this project in the Eden Valley. So I was hoping you could give us an overview about that kind of impetus of, of doing Riesling in the Eden Valley. And... Um, how that kind of came about. Yes, absolutely. So um, the Pusey Vale Vineyard has a history that goes right back to 1847, um, when um, uh, an Englishman, Joseph Gilbert, came out from Wiltshire and um, took up a large area of land in what is now known as the Eden Valley. And he had um, spent a little bit of time in France. He fancied himself as a bit of a winemaker. And even though most of his property was dedicated to grazing of, of animals, he did plant a small vineyard and Riesling was one of the first varieties that he planted in 1847. It was, um, you know, at a time when, um, you know, there were already a few vines and a few vineyards that had been planted in the Barossa um, Valley, which is, um, as you mentioned, um, just down the hill. And in fact, in that photograph there, whoops, if you can go, can we go back to that last photograph um, of the Pusey Vale Vineyard? On the left-hand side of that screen, you, in, right in the distance, you can see um, the Barossa Valley. So that photograph is looking um, from the Eden Valley um, and it just has a little bit of a peak of the Barossa Valley, which is about 
600 feet um, lower in altitude than, uh, than, than the Eden Valley. And so that's really what the difference of it is. So they're, they're two regions right next door to each other, very different because of that altitude. That altitude gives us cooler nights and, and which is just perfect for aromatic grape varieties like Riesling. Anyway, so Joseph Gilbert planted his vineyard there and for three generations, right up until the depression in the 1920s, he and his son and then his grandson made wines um, and were very famous for their Riesling wines. Um, when the fourth generation came along, they weren't specifically interested in, in wine and it was a tough time um, for, um, for everyone in Australia and around the world with the depression. And so they, they carved up the, 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 what was a very large property um, and subdivided it and sold it off. And that was the last of the Gilbert um, and the history of Pusey Vale at that time. And then in 1961, the then owner of the vineyard, um, uh, Jeff Parsons, um, got together with um, Wyndham Hillsmith, um, the Hillsmith family, um, who owned um, Yalumba. And as you say, they've got a, you know, a long history with wine in, um, in the Eden Valley and the Barossa Valley as well. Um, and established, uh, re-established the Pusey Vale vineyard back to Riesling. So the modern history, if you like, of Pusey Vale goes back to um, 1961. And that's um, that other photograph that was, well, both the, the colour photographs that you've shown are, are from the beautiful sort of vineyard of, of Pusey Vale now, um, which is all about Riesling. Um, and the wine we've got today is, the, is where most of those grapes go. Fantastic. And what does the name Pusey Vale? What does that, does that have any history? Was that what it's already called? Yeah, so the Vale of Pusey is in Wiltshire. So it was where Joseph Gilbert came from. Um, and he got to these sort of beautiful undulating hills um, in the Eden Valley and it reminded him of home. So he named it um, Pusey Vale after, after where he came from. I love that. Well, I'm, I, I want to taste this in a moment, but I also just kind of want to talk about, I don't think people associate Riesling often with Australia. So tell me a little bit about what, what you think is unique to Riesling in Australia. And I know that you have these primary regions of Clare Valley, Eden Valley, but what, what makes Australia Riesling unique? Uh, well, I, it's really hard to, to talk about Australian wine when we are, if you pick up Australia and you, you overlay it over Europe, you know, all you'd have to do is pick up Spain and sort of move it a bit and you've got, you know, a country which is as diverse in its wine regions as, as Europe is. But, um, so you mentioned Eden Valley and Clare in South Australia, which are probably the, you know, two of the most historic regions for, for Riesling. Um, and many others, you know, Canberra, Western Australia, and even more recently, Tasmania. Typically, um, the wines uh, tend to be dry. And I think Riesling is one of those wines that is all about balance. And depending on where it comes from around the world, the balance of its, its palate, which comes from the flavours, comes from its natural acidity, and then comes from whatever residual sugar is left in the wine, um, is really important. And in Australia, because we have so much beautiful sunshine, our regions, you know, even though we would talk about Eden Valley being, being a cooler region because of its cool nights, it's not a cold region on a global scale. Um, so we have enough sunshine to get our grapes beautifully and ripe. And so the natural balance of our wines tends to be around wines that don't have residual sugar. They have richness and, and, and sweetness from, it, from their flavors and from the, uh, you know, the natural alcohols that form from that sugar. Um, balanced by Riesling's beautiful natural acidity. So I think the, the dry style of Riesling is typical of what we see um, from, uh, from Australia and then from Eden Valley, that's overlaid with the beautiful Eden Valley flavors of um, uh, you know, limes and, and white flowers, um, dried herbs, I often see sort of flavors like ro dried rosemary in these wines and that lovely sort of you know, soft um, Moorish acidity. Yeah, I'm getting all those lovely, the, the blossom, like the, the, the white flowers just stood out as soon as you said that. And then I've always kind of associated a kind of a line back a line. to a lot of the, both Claire and Eden Valley. There's something that, that citrus, but particularly in the, the lime camp that I, I love. It's definitely not prominent, but it, it's always kind of underlying. So, um, but can you talk us through uh, tasting this a little bit and just kind of how that represents maybe some of the soil and where it's coming from in those vineyards and the high elevation? Sure. Well, um, you can't see from those photographs in the vineyard, but our, our soils um, in the Eden Valley and particularly in the high Eden area where Pusey Vale is. So we're up about 1500 feet above sea level um, and our soils are very shallow. Um, you know, sometimes there's only, you know, only literally only a, a foot of, of, of soil and that soil is very sandy. It's decomposed granite and, and, um, and schist. And um, it's, uh, it's got quite a lot of gravel within it. It's got quartz stones and mica and, and those sort of things. So 
It's perfect for Riesling that doesn't need a lot of fertile um, ground. Um, the vines um, are naturally balanced. We don't need to use a lot. We don't train them. They just grow on a, on a single wire, um, you know, with, 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 with sort of low vigor. And what that does is that that gives a, a, a canopy which is quite sort of open. Um, this, the, the leaves sort of have a dappled shading of the grapes. And so they develop these lovely, um, the, as you say, these sort of citrus sort of lime and, and, and lemon characters. And in riper years, maybe even, you know, a hint towards some of those sort of tropical sort of pineapple characters. So on the 2019 wine, which is the wine that I'm tasting, and I think the wine that you've got um, at the moment, um, I see, you know, quite a lot of those um, those sort of lime characters. This wine's been in the bottle now for just over 12 months, so it's just starting to also get a little bit of a hint of of like a fresh sort of toast character that, um, you know, like a piece of sort of you know scorched bread, um, which is one of those characteristics that Riesling will get with a little bit of age. I also see that dried herb character. Um, you know, like a dried rosemary or an oregano um, on, on the nose. And then when you taste this wine, those, those aromas come right onto the palate. Um, but the thing which I think characterizes Pusey Val Riesling so much is that, that quite sort of soft acidity. So it's refreshing and it's got that lovely acidity. But one of the things that people often say to me about Pusey Val Riesling is that, you know, we, love, we really enjoy Pusey Val Riesling because, you know, sometimes Riesling is too acidic. Um, and so I think this wine is something that breaches the gap between people that might like more full-bodied wines and people that love Riesling um, because it's, 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 it's classic Riesling, but it hasn't got some of that racy, really racy driving acidity that the Riesling lovers amongst us in the world, you know, do love. Um, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I, 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 you know, the more acid, the better sometimes for me in, in wines. But I know that for a lot of people, you know, they like wines that have that sort of softness. And that's really very characteristic of what we see out of the out of the Eden Valley with our reasons. Yeah, and it's it's so pretty. And I often introduce this wine to people who hesitate when they hear the word Riesling. Um, also, not only because it's dry, but again, because of that, that certain softness to it. Um, so I'm a big fan. All, all these wines often are in my um, on my table or in my cellar. So um, I want to talk a little bit about aging. So I know that there's another level of your Riesling contours, which is another one of my absolute uh, favorites. And I, I think that one lovely photo we showed of the winding vineyards are the contours. Can you speak a little bit to, to aging Riesling, Australian Riesling? I can, um, but first of all, there was one word that I missed out of the tasting note, and I think it's really important for, for any wine that, you know, despite all of the characteristics that we might talk about with a wine, you know, the most important thing is that wine is really delicious. Um, and I think um, we've just, I've just come off the back of Adelaide Wine Show judging a, um, last week and the, and the week before. And one of the things that I said to the judges, um, you know, in the sort of the, the, the startup was, you know, at the end of the day, you can be all technically correct and everything else, but you know, if delicious or yummy or something like that isn't one of your descriptors, um, then, you know, that wine probably isn't a great wine. So um, whether young or with age, and as you say, Riesling, I, I often talk about it as one of the great aging varieties, white or red of the world. Um, Riesling can age as long, if not longer than many red wines. and and we don't often think about that, I know, in terms of white wines, but these wines just gradually take on these beautiful overlaying flavours of, as I say, that sort of toast. Um, the limes gradually, you know, turn into lime marmalade. Um, we get flavours like sage and sage oil coming through in the herb, in the herb spectrum, um, you know, lemongrass, but always with that beautiful, refreshing sort of, you know, soft acidity that comes through. And of course, you know, in our in our world, you know, with the screw caps on these wines, um, it 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 keeps the wines incredibly consistent from bottle to bottle, which is something which um, you know is important for reliability of wine as well. So, um, we do uh, we do love aging riesling, and um, our aged wine that we have as an offering as a as a, as a wine um, current release is our contours riesling. So we call it the Pusey Val the contours. The label is very similar. It has a little gold strip above the top of it. And that comes out as a wine with at least six years of bottle age on it. So like we do with the current vintage wine, we bottle that and it stays in the bottle here in our nice cool um, cellars um, for, you know, for that sort of six years. And then we start to, we start to release it. And the contours also comes from one particular par parcel of grapes on the vineyard, um, a block that was planted in 1965. And as you say, it's planted on those curvy rows. And, and we talk about the contours as the rows being planted on the contour of the hill. So we have a, a gradual slope and the slopes sort of wind around a bit. And so if you lie on your side, 
the rows are nice and straight. So uh, over time, those contoured rows form these little terraces. Um, and they were designed that way, um, you know, in the 60s when um, that was the way that we had for um, protecting our soils. So the precious rains, when they do fall, um, they, they absorb into those, into those sort of contours or those terraces um, and don't um, erode the, the soils, our really precious soils down the hill. So um, that's why these days our, our viticulture is a bit different. We tend to plant a lot of grasses and um, we look for biodiversity within our vineyards. But uh, when these vines were planted, um, the weed control was done by ploughing. And so there was always just sort of fresh, friable soil around the vines. Um, and these days, attractive drivers don't like driving around curvy rows. They like straight rows. So, um, you know, new vineyards tend to be planted in straight rows, but uh, some of the older vineyards, particularly in slopey country, are still on the contours. Well, both these reasons are wonderful. I mean, well, this reason, but I've had the contours. Encourage anyone else to, to try it. It's, it's, it's quite stunning. So thank you so much for sharing and, and making beautiful wine. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, so then we are going to move on to the Torbrek Cuvée Juvenile. Juveniles, the juveniles, the kid wine, right, Ian? Can we call it just the kids wine? Um, so, Ian, um, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to see you. Um, fantastic to be here. Fantastic. So, so Torbrecht, a little bit younger than, than these other two, two winers we're talking about, but it has quickly become known over the past two decades as just a quality producer of Rhone varietals and Barossa. It's uh, with just incredible sought after um, bottlings. And what is it about Torbrecht, do you think, that, that makes it this quintessential Barossa wine? I think, um, you know, Torbrecht was started in 1994 and then really it's just been on a quest to uh, seek out vineyards and sites that I think really express what the region can do. And the vineyards that we own or work with um, essentially run uh, predominantly along the Western Ridge. And one of the things I love about working in the Barossa is that beautiful, and we also take fruit from the Eden Valley as well, it's that beautiful contrast between the delicacy and finesse that somewhere like the Eden Valley can bring to Riesling, and in our case Shiraz, but then also the power and energy that we can get from the Western Ridge. So the Western Ridge is, is essentially polar opposite in geology to what takes place in Eden Valley. So we're looking at um, lots of ironstone. It's an older, it's the older side to the valley and the soils are more depleted. But they tend to be more um, uh, red brown earths uh, with either an underlying uh, structure based on ironstone or uh, quartz or uh, chalk, limestone. So we have this incredible diversity, but then it also runs from the southern end of the valley at 160 metres above sea level to the northern end of the valley and even Ebenezer up to about 300 metres above sea level. So that gives us about six weeks difference in ripening from south to north. Um, so what we really try to do is find these very, very unique sites that traditionally express um, old clonal material. So we have an extraordinary high percentage of very, very old vineyards in our, in our stable. And from that, we sort of nurture and resurrect a lot of these sites and bring them back. And, and they grow a different type of fruit to the modern clones, which are designed to uh, ripen quickly and, you know, in the, in the tank, in the bank is the saying. So there's risk in the sort of fruit we grow. We hang it out longer. It takes longer for the tannins to mature, the colour to stabilise and the, and the, and the flavours to develop. Um, and... I guess we believe inherently that where we are in this part of the world is that is that we are uh, given this opportunity to create wines that can be pushed. So we tend to perhaps push the boundaries quite a lot in the winemaking and in the viticulture um, in, in the sense that we take the wines to a place where we develop other flavours and other tannins and other textures. And it separates, I guess, the style of wine that we make and it's identified as, as being quite unique in that respect. Wow. It, it takes, there's a lot of pressure on you at Vintage because everyone wants to pick and you, and you sort of, you get yeah. to be uh, just a negative saying no to everyone. And, and we, tend to, we tend to push the fruit. We have um, a very high percentage of dry grown vineyards. So even in, in this climate, we still continue to, to dry grow fruit, um, which generally gives us a very, very low yields. So 
quite thick skins, very resilient bunches. And, you know, from that comes up to, for us another level of flavour, which we, yeah. we seek in our wines. Yeah, those very intense flavours that come from those old vines. And um, what are some of the average years of those vines? You said very old. So our oldest, our oldest vines back to 1850. Um, and that, uh, that building and that vineyard that you saw in the slideshow there, that's yeah. our hillside property. So that yeah. was um, it's a very large source of fruit for, um, for our portfolio of wines. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty special stuff that we get to work with. Old and gnarly vines. So Torbrek, um, what, is, what does that word uh, mean? Yeah, so Torbrek is a forest in Scotland, the, 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 the founding uh, Founder Dave Powell uh, was working there and came back with inspiration to uh, inspire on sort of a lot of the Torek naming and, and Scottish naming of, of that region. And uh, so it's a it's a forest. So uh, it's it's where the inspiration of something like Woodcutters our Shiraz comes from. And uh, yeah, and a lot of the names that we have are reminiscent of of, of his journey wow. in that time. Well, that's perfect. And I know that there are some um, uh, forest like. Um, trees on, on some of your the labels, so uh, yeah, yeah, um, and that's, so, that, yeah. That's, where it's that's where it's from. Makes sense. So, um, this wine that we're having, the Cuvée Juvenil, I have loved this wine since I don't know when it first came out, um, but I've loved it for a very long time. And I know the label changed a little bit, but the quality has stayed the same. So, this is Grenache Mataro, otherwise known as Morved, and Shiraz, yeah. which which I love. Again, this is this Rune um, varietal blend. So can we, let's taste and talk through it. Maybe you can talk a little bit about like what each variety is bringing to the blend and then maybe how that, what kind of broth or age, you know, just give us a little bit of what's making it delicious. I guess first of the inspiration of the wine is all about um, a Cote de Rhone blend and we're looking for something that's um, a little fresher. So in the winemaking, we use no oak. This is only stainless steel. And we're really looking for sites that give us um, uh, lighter expressions of the, of the wine. So we see uh, more aromaticity, a little bit more tension in Grenache, a little bit more softer tannin in Shiraz, and some lovely earthy wild spice that comes from right. Paro. And being Grenache dominant, it, it tends to be, you know, a little more medium weight. And, you know, this is a description of lunchtime red. Uh, yeah. So having a bistro and and, uh, you know, in, inspired by that culture of, of, of a plate of food and, and uh, a little glass of bread. The vineyards that, we, that make up this blend essentially tend to have more sand in the soils and tend to be a softer rock profile. So we tend to get um, that aromaticity um, exemplifies out of the fruit and then also those slightly softer tannins. We have a, a strong synergy to sort of the hard rock sites giving firm structure and firm tannins. It tends to make these bigger wines that, uh, the Shiraz particularly, and then when you go into these sort of more softer rock and sandier profiles, we get uh, a little bit more elegance in the wines and they're more suited to making a blend like this. I better get a glass. Yeah, where's your glass? Um, yeah, sometimes, you know, I, I sometimes call this like almost um, a Christmas wine because I love the spices that come from that Grenache and and uh, Morvet and Shiraz, all of those. It's almost like that nutmeg and clove that come through and that lovely baked uh, fruit kind of character. But it also just has such a, it just has an energy to it that I that kind of brings it all together. I think the triple treat of those three varieties is that, you know they each they each bring something and then perhaps if you were to be contemplative about the blend, you're looking for that perhaps that missing component. So, you know, with Grenache, you get that, that beautiful silky feel, the red fruit, the raspberry, um, those sort of dark cherry notes coming through. And then, you know, when you see when you see some spice and earth and some complexity, that's where Mataro comes in and, uh, and brings that kind of earthy wild note with that, um, you know, forest floor and, and, and the spice. And then just for that little bit more flesh and just to fill the palate out, you introduce Shiraz and it doesn't need a lot of Shiraz is about 10% normally used in the blend and that just gives it that little bit of plumping on the palate and rounds it all out so it becomes actually for you know what is considered a, a, a lovely approachable daily drink it's actually quite complex and actually and actually div it delivers a lot um, I quite like these wines young with all their vibrancy but uh, 
actually to sell them, there's no problem and, and they become very complex. And the pedigree of the vineyards and the way they're grown, um, we, we don't claim organic status, but we, uh, we use what we call a sustainable practice, which is a certified process in our, in our viticulture. Um, and all of our inputs are essentially uh, organic composted cow manure, uh, worm water, things like that. And basically we don't work the soils. We have uh, permanent crops through the, the soil that introduce their own nitrogen and the hand pruned, they're hand picked. And so there's a lot of effort and energy that goes into the way the grapes are grown. And they've generally got to hang there for a fair bit of time. So we want to sort of get the background to the way the vineyards are set up right. And for us, it delivers wine that has, uh, you know, another level of perfume, another level of, of texture and flavour. And uh, yeah, I, I, I yeah, think no, it's a I, really you don't great think expression. I do. I, I love the ears. I like that there's complexity. Again, you've got the, the fruit and the spice and the herbs and the, and then the, the great structure that kind of integrates those all and then has that lovely lingering finish. So. I just, it's a bright, but yes, it's kind of a serious one. It's just, yeah, it's kind of got this yin yang that I really um, appreciate. So I did want to ask a little bit about your thoughts on Grenache, because this is primarily Grenache. We often think of Australia and particularly Barossa as Shiraz country, but um, I've spoken to a few people who've done Grenache in Australia, um, talking about how plantings are increasing. Can you, is that what you're seeing? Are you seeing more Grenache in that region? Yeah, we're, we're, we're nuts for Grenache. We love it. And so we've actually, in some vineyards, have pulled out Shiraz and planted Grenache. You know, we've had some incredibly dry uh, years. 19 was particularly dry. Um, and at the end of the season, you saw sort of Shiraz begin to defoliate and, I guess, give up, uh, whereas Grenache just sort of sits there like, I'm ready, come get me. And uh, it's, uh, it's an incredible variety that's very, very suited to in our climate and it you know from a spectrum point of view depending on how you want to make it it's got incredible diversity so we're very uh, passionate about that we believe in it we're planting it on our vineyards um, because all the Grenache now is old in the Brossa um, everyone went and planted Shiraz or Cabernet and um, uh, no one planted Grenache so the actual our oldest Grenache that we're probably working with is probably around um, 65 years old and going to well in excess of uh, of a hundred years old, um, so it's we've got to regenerate these sites for uh, future generations of winemakers. And um, yeah, our our belief in the variety is that it's something that's very suited to what we do, and it makes a great drink. It gives you it gives you that more medium weight feeling wine, and it's beautiful. You know, I love it. And I've always been a huge fan of Grenache, so thank you for for planting more. And yes, the older the older the better. So, um, so thank you, Ian. This is delicious. I appreciate you sharing this with us and making Cheers. the wines. Cheers. So checking in with Chester Osborne. Um, no relation, just FYI, in case you're... Um, <laughs> oh, Gwendolyn, great to see you again. Great to see you too, yes. Um, so we're here to talk about the dead arm Shiraz, but also about Derenberg in, in general. So appreciate you being here to, to talk about wine um so your, your family has been planting vines since 1912 but i mean you and your father are really you know these people that, that kind of transformed or propelled mclaren vale into a certain realm here you are with your lovely father uh dairy and the name named darren Berg, his uh mother's maiden name um so and this is me back in 2007 um getting a lesson from your father on on a, a vine cutting of some sort so uh, back in the day, but um, you know, I, I love McLaren Vale. I think it's it's very unique. What you know, kind of, how did your vision in McLaren Vale evolve? Because I know you know, back in the day, it was sweet wines, and then you know, you and your father um, kind of took that to a whole new level. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, um, well, actually, McLaren Vale is south of Adelaide, along the coast, and Barossa is north of Adelaide. So, um, and Barossa was settled by the Germans, um, and uh, McLaren Vale was settled by the English, actually. So there's a bit of difference, interestingly. Um, and, and actually, the first region to be planted um, was actually uh, McLaren Vale in 1837. And uh, and so uh, the oldest find in South Australia is actually McLaren. But uh, and uh, a lot of the time it was actually dry red. 
that they were making uh, in a very small cottage industry for, for many years through those 1800s. And then uh, in the early 1900s or the late 1800s, fortified wines really started to become very popular. And uh, a lot of it was port wines uh, uh, from Shiraz mostly. And, uh, and Grenache gradually crept in, in in the early 1900s more and more uh, for a fortified wine. Uh, and then uh, really um, uh, uh, in 1950, when it was still a relatively small industry, but starting to dry red was starting to become pretty popular, McLaren Vale made half of the dry red of Australia uh, in 1950. Um, uh, and a lot of it was exported to England, actually. Um, and, uh, so, uh, and then in the late 50s, um, that company went bust in England. And, uh, and we all had to come up with our own labels because we didn't have a market for that bulk wine anymore. And uh, so we all started bottling under our labels and uh, that's when we started Derenberg. But well, we really started Derenberg, as I say, 1912. Although actually my great grandfather was a director of Hardy's Wines, treasurer of Hardy's Wines uh, in McLaren Vale from 1881. So we've been in the wine industry in McLaren Vale for nearly 140 years. But it was 1912 that he, he uh, left Hardy's and bought the vineyard. Um, he sold all his horses, his big in race horses. And one of our most popular wines is the football Shiraz, which is a horse that he had. And, uh, and then, uh, yeah, he sold the horses. Uh, and then we built the wine in 1927. So we made wines in a small way for drinking and selling to private people a bit for many years. But uh, it was in the 19, late 1950s that we really developed that red stripe label, the Downwood label. And, uh, and made a great reputation through the 60s, my father, um, with, uh, with wines and, uh, in the marketplace in Australia. And then uh, and I joined the company, well, I started in the late 60s <laughs> in my holidays. I worked half of all my holidays through my whole life. And, uh, and then uh, um, I finished a, a winemaking degree in 1983 and came back and was, uh, became a winemaker chief winemaker from 83 onwards. So, so uh, now Dad had, um, had worked the vineyard with horses all his life, uh, well, well, the beginning part of his life, I should say, until the late 40s, and then got the first rubber-tied tractor in the Crown Valley, which he loves because he can bore up and down the roads and kill all the weeds and plants. And then when I came back home and I started working with, quite interestingly, derelict vineyards, uh, vineyards that have been let go during uh, the 80s uh, of growers, and found really amazing flavours of vines that hadn't been worked at all and hadn't been fertilised or watered or anything, no pruning. And, and I found that these had amazing expressions of, of the soil and, and great acidities and great lively tannins. And, and, I, and I suddenly went, oh, my God, I think we, maybe we're getting things a bit wrong in the vineyard. I told my father we're going to stop cultivating, stop herbicides, stop uh, irrigation if we can, and stop any nitrogenous fertilisers. And uh, he said, well, we should sell the vineyard now before they all die well, so we can get something for it. And he was very surprised at how the vineyards went from making, um, I suppose we were selling quite a lot of uh, more affordable wines to suddenly selling nowadays, uh, not suddenly, but gradually selling lots and lots of, uh, of really quite uh, prestigious wines and really getting the most out of those vineyards without actually losing a lot of yield, but uh, just making a lot, lot uh, more quality grapes. Yeah. No, and I know in a lot of those, I mean, I know you've got the Derelict Vineyard that's on your label. Um, you have, you know, the football shroud. So I love what you've taken of kind of all these efforts um, to put on, on your label and it kind of become this, you know, icon winery in McLaren Vale. So you were just mentioning McLaren Vale as a place. Um, talk a little bit about how, where it is and, and the climate that comes in and the soils and how that influences those vineyards. Yeah, it's it's quite unique. We're actually at the top end of a peninsula, the Fleuria Peninsula. Um, the region is quite uh, small, really. It's only about sort of, I suppose, in miles, you're working miles, uh, uh, 10 or so miles uh, along the seafront and extends inland about 10 miles as well and is a triangle. So that triangle will then hook up. And the, uh, to the east uh, is actually the, the Adelaide Hills region, which is 
you know, the southern Mount Lofty Ranges. Uh, and that has a big impact in McLaren Vale. So we get, um, in winters, we'll have quite mild weather being near the sea. It'll be quite maritime um, and, uh, and then having the sea to the south as well, being the top of the peninsula. And, and then spring will happen relatively early because it's quite mild. And, and that's good because we don't get frost. Uh, we've very rarely ever seen a frost in, in McLaren Vale because, because of that mild weather. Uh, uh, but then as we get into summer, well, uh, the continentality grows quite a lot, which is quite unusual for being relatively close to the sea. So we get uh, quite a big daytime, nighttime temperature variation uh, for uh, for summer. And that's important because you want to get the rich, ripe colours and flavours and whatever. And you still want to have the fragrance and the and the flowery length and the aromatics in the, in the wine uh, by having the cool nights. So that's a beautiful thing. Um, and then autumn comes and often, you know, vintages can be quite late. Uh, we, we are relatively cool the part where we are in McLaren Vale. It, we're about halfway between in temperature between Chateauneuf de Pape and Cote Rotie in the, in the Rhone Valley. So we're, we're at least a degree colder than Chateauneuf de Pape. So, so it's, uh, it's, it's probably aimed at Shiraz. Um, of course, well, climate change is changing everything, but anyway, that's another old question. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but the, um, we have uh, quite mild autumns, which are beautiful weather, and uh, we don't get leaf senescence very quickly because of them. Uh, you know, it's not going to be as cold in winter. So so we can always ripen late vintages and late ripening varieties, which is uh, really uh, a great asset. The only the one other amazing thing about McLaren Vale, well, there's probably many, but, but uh, is that we, uh, we have, um, uh, we're in the rain shadow of the summer storms that might come from Queensland. So the, the tropical storms up in northern South Australia, a big tail of wet, cloudy weather might come down, um, uh, you know, hot, hot, moist air, and then, and then hit the cool air of South Australia and dump on northern South Australia. But it'll, the Adelaide Hills, Hills region will suck the clouds dry and we'll miss out on that uh, summer rain, which of course you don't really want. Uh, so it doesn't happen every year, of course, but, but in the years it does, we, we miss out on uh, a major part of that rain and that makes uh, dry red production extremely good in this region. Yes, it does. I will just say that from knowing drinking your wines, that it absolutely does. So the wine that we're tasting today is the Dead Arm Shiraz, which I love, I love this name because there is such thing as a dead arm. It's you, you tip, you tip, a, you tip a dieback disease that happens to a vine. And I think we have an um, image of one where one arm or one half of the vine dies. And so all the energy of the other vine, um, all the energy of the vine goes into this other arm. Um, so this is, this is actually from your, your vineyard. So you've named this dead arm. So you're in a vineyard with all dead arms? Yeah, so um, you can see the dead arm there, the, the arm that's sitting there with no shoots coming out of it. This is a picture taken in autumn, obviously. Uh, so it's actually a bit after harvest and the leaves are coming off. Um, but uh, you can see that there's quite fairly low vigour. Um, you can also see we didn't cultivate, we just mowed to reduce the competition. Uh, but uh, by only having part of the vine alive, then um, all those roots are now working, these old vines are working on the, uh, the deep uh, geology underneath and, and the source and putting all that effort into just a small part of the vine and a small crop, which uh, means that there's less stress because there's less uh, water demand and there's, and there's more soil character, more earth character. And the, the older the vines, I find the more the geology expression is, which is underneath the soil, um, and you'll see more tar and soot and, and uh, peat um, and, and exotic fragrances that are quite uh, interesting. Sometimes vine wood, I call it like wood. You can smell wood in the, in the wine when it's, when it's not often. I mean, the, you, know, you can smell all that earth in this wine. It's really quite a, a complex, rich uh, wine. But, but we're, um, we're also very particular about uh, picking. And because I haven't been putting any nitrogenous fertilizers on for at least 20 years, then the, the grapes actually ripen, get a, a fruit ripeness at a slightly lower sugar level than what I might need to if I, if I had the nitrogenous uh, fertilizer, which keeps it vegetative. So, so it, 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 yeah, I can pick it a bit earlier and I get this beautiful fragrance and you can see this fennel spice and, uh, and lift uh, and, uh, and, all, and all sorts of violet-like notes. It's yeah. uh, still, I mean, is it the 16 or the 17 that you've got there? Um, I think I left, I apologize, I left my bottle up with my parents because they're thirsty. But um, 
Well, I think it's only the difference. But I think it is the 16. Um, I'm almost positive it's the 16, but I, I do. I mean, all of these wines, and I've had this open for over an hour, and it's just, oh, it's just really evolved. And like you're saying, I, it's almost like when you said other wood, I thought sandalwood. It's some sort of, um, there's spice, and there's herbs, and there's fruit, and there's all these just kind of lovely components integrating and changing in the nose. So, yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I think you would be on sixteen. I think the seventeen's only just about to come out over there. Um, but the sixteen is a bigger, chunkier wine, and uh, and uh, has uh, more licorice notes and earth notes, and and a bigger tannins that, that are really, um, you know, it's a wine that needs to be aged um, for years. I, mean, I, I like to start drinking them when they're eight years old, and then they'll drink for many, many years because everything we do is about trying to maintain their wine as, as a youthful wine and, and to age for, for a long, long time. The great wine is really measured by its balance and then its terroir presence, uh, this place, place, uh, sense of place, and then its ageability. And so, uh, so I, I've really always, Darenberg has always been uh, forefront in, in that having wines that age. And the 1960s is still drinking fantastic. But the, if the, when we move on to the 2017, you'll see uh, this wine is a much later vintage. It was actually a month later than what current vintages have been. Okay. And it has an enormous flowery fennel spice and flowery fennel length, which goes on and on and on. I mean, we always get a bit of that, but in the 17, it's enormous. Yeah. And, it, and it won the uh, the best wine in the world in London just uh, a month or so ago. Uh, in the, it was the best wine of the show over in London. So we we're quite excited about that. And I, I always believed in, the, in the, that particular vintage is a great vintage. Uh, I mentioned that these vines are old vines. Mm -hmm. So about 15% uh, are actually vines that are 25 years old, so not so old. And, and those vines have a uh, have to be great sites and have to give a lot of spiciness and lovely vibrant tannins and and, uh, and you know Shiraz characters. But but it's fifty percent of the vine of the wine is made from fifty year old vines, and these are more earthy and more rustic and more of the geology characters coming through and and uh, uh, complex. And then thirty five percent of it are from vines that are about 100 years old, in fact, up to 120 years old. And these uh, have these really rustic uh, so soil geology characters that are, that are more peaty and, and add all these uh, crazy layers to the wine, which is uh, quite a lot of fun. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and like you said, these, these wines can age. I love the, the structure of this. So, um, so thank you. Yes, always been a fan of this, actually all these wines, like I said. And they're all, I think, age-worthy, but they're still enjoyable now. It's um, but before we leave you, Chester, I, I did, I don't think we can leave without talking really quickly about the cube, um, uh, this architectural feat that you have put on your property. Um, I think we have an image of it. It's, um, it's, it's large. It looks like somebody could have just dropped a Rubik's cube, I think, in the vineyard, but I think we have an effective <laughs> shot that shows you the actual size of, of this. So um, what, what is the cube? There we are, yeah. So, yes, you can see uh, the, uh, the people now to give you a perspective of how big the building is. It's a five-storey high uh, giant uh, Darenberg cube in the middle, floating in the middle of the vineyard. It's on mirrors. Um, and it represents Darenberg. I, we needed a new tasting room and restaurant, and, it, and I, wanted to, I wanted to get a building that was like the Opera House in Sydney Harbour that has becomes very unique and, and tells a story. And uh, the story of Darenberg is uh, label names are such a puzzle to work out. Wine is such a puzzle to work out. I went, well, what's the most iconic puzzle? A Rubik's Cube. But instead of colours on the outside, I put puzzles on the outside and it became the Darenberg Cube. And so I actually have a – we actually sell them here. You can try and solve them. They're pretty hard to work out. But uh, it, yeah, it has uh, um, a lot of art in there. So you get a whole – immersive journey into the Darenberg nature. Uh, so all the generations, the way we make wines, so we're organic and biodynamic. We're the largest biodynamic grower in Australia. And so you know, there's a bull hugging a polygraph representing that. There's an, an automatic wine, uh, auto winemaker there that you put the grapes in, turn it on and walk away. And a month later, you come back and the wine's all automatically made. So the first, world's first fully automated natural winemaker as well it is. And, and there's so many things going on in this building. Uh, and, and you can taste one of, uh, or many of our 76 wines that we, uh, that we make at Darenberg. 
Yeah. Well, one day I hope that, um, you know, someday soon, I hope that everybody can come to visit. Um, I have been to Australia only once, but I, we always say that it's some of the nicest people and the most welcoming that we've ever met. We did have the chance to um, um, go to Yolumba, which uh, is the, the Hillsmith family, which uh, Louisa here represents. And we met Ian, but not at Torbeck. Um, but I know Torbeck very well and, and can't wait to see that. And then of course, um, Derenberg with, with the new cube. So um, it's a beautiful place to visit. The wines of Australia are amazing. I look forward to the future of Australia. I know Chester and I know Robert, Robert Hill Smith all have daughters who are gonna be taking over the helm, which is <laughs> exciting for the, the Australian future. Um, and I just, I appreciate all of you being here and taking the time to um, share your wines and your stories, which are lovely. Uh, if you didn't have a chance to taste these wines or you want to learn more about them, they're all on wine.com. And we just have a host of other Australian wines available as well, which to me just, there's a little bit of something for everyone there. So uh, Chester, Louisa, and Ian, thank you again for being here. And- um, Cheers, Gwendolyn. Thanks, bye. Thank you. See you, everybody. It's both a science and a form of high art. It's made from the combination of grapes, sunlight, rain, soil, and time. It's raised up in the moments that matter. It's wine. And we are wine.com. We have the largest wine selection in the world, online sommeliers with free advice, and now our powerful new app puts the entire world of wine in your hands. Wine.com, seriously passionate about wine. Download our free app today.